Welcome to another episode of Expected Buffalo, the offering. And I think I've finally taken enough time uh, to calm myself down from the stressful Yankees game. Um, as you can see, instead of going to the Expected Buffalo hat tonight, kept the Yankees hat on after a nice Game 3 win in Kansas City. Uh, so I, I've, I've calmed the emotions here. Um, so I'm not too revved up <laughs> to talk about uh, the first two games of the Saber season and the opener um, tomorrow or tonight, depending when you're listening, um, of the season for the Saber. So we have a lot to touch on here from stuff that has happened since the opener, the opener itself, some takeaways, and then looking ahead uh, to the next few games here moving forward back in North America. Now that the NHL season is in full go. So let's start with the news thing. Uh, that occurred here not unexpected but maybe a little bit i'm a little bit surprised it actually did happen um and that's with james reimer being claimed on waivers um again you when he signed and this whole thing was the plan of you know levi staying in the nhl and then reimer gonna be the three is a security blanket it all made sense and there was always the possibility that he wouldn't have to you know, he would end up being claimed on waivers when they sent him down to the AHL. Sure enough, that's what happened here. Anaheim Ducks put in the claim, and now he is a member of the Ducks for we'll see how long. Uh, John Gibson is out for three to six weeks from an appendectomy, so one would leave you to believe they're not going to put Lucas Dostal through waivers. He's going to be their goaltender for now until Gibson is back. Reimer might get a few games. And then once Reimer is, or once Gibson is back, I would anticipate Reimer being placed on waivers again. And then the Sabres have the opportunity to claim him. Now, the important thing here um, that I think people understand there's some confusion on first priority and all of that when they reclaim a player. Um, the rule is pretty simple that if he's placed on waivers again, uh, the Sabres can claim him and send him down to the AHL immediately. They don't have to put him on the NHL roster. Now, that changes, and that's something that actually happened to the Edmonton Oilers recently. If another team puts a claim in on that player, uh, so puts a claim in on Reimer, then the Sabres have to add him to their NHL roster. Uh, they can't put him directly into the AHL. So the Edmonton Oilers just had that very scenario unfold for them. Uh, was with Brett, with um, the, I forgot who the exact player was, but one of the players they put on waivers, they reclaimed him back. Uh, there was actually another team that put in a waiver claim on that player too, so now he had to stay on the NHL roster. So I, I know there's been some confusion in the past about first priority and all of that. So that's rule 13.22 in the CBA. Yes, I looked it up the other day um, just to verify. So there's no really first priority, if you will. It's simply... They have the opportunity to claim him back. If nobody does, nobody else puts a claim on him, he can go directly to the AHL. Uh, if someone does and he gets to stay in the NHL roster or you know, let the other team claim him, however, that would so work. I mean, I'm not anticipating at this point the Sabres are going to bring another goaltender. They haven't done anything. The Amherst season gets underway on Friday, which we'll talk about at the end here. Um, you know, Felix Sandstrom is going to be the goaltender that starts. You would assume, I guess you could say, even that's not guaranteed. Uh, that would start for the Amherst on Friday and hold down the fort until hopefully Reimer is back in the organization sometime in November. Um, and then Michael Hauser would be the number two goaltender. Maybe it's a split 1A, 1B um, down in Rochester for the time being. It's unfortunate, you know, with the way we've seen Sandstrom perform in the preseason and they look at his number some last year, there's not a lot of confidence there. Uh, not only from the perspective in the AHL when the Amherst are trying to be a team, you know, it's a playoff team and development and all that. Um, but one injury, something, um, you're right there with Felix Samstrom having to play games for you. For you. So hopefully it doesn't get to that. Hopefully this is a short-term thing, and then Reimer can get back in the organization here soon um, if he's put on waivers again, as one would anticipate in, you know, I don't know, four to five weeks. So we'll see how that plays out in a couple of weeks. Now that we got the newsy thing out of the way, I'm really going to talk about the injuries. Circa Benson looks like they're going to play um, in the opener. So I'm not going to get into a bunch of that. What I do want to spend some time on 
is getting into the two games in Prague. So the Sabres end up losing both of those games. <coughs> Excuse me. Man, this COVID cough is lingers. Uh, the Sabres lost the two games in Prague, not looking great in either of those games. And there's really, it, it's a lot of things that went wrong. If you will, a lot of things that don't really give you confidence that they've been corrected in the summer because some of the stuff is carryover from last year. Uh, but you can also at the same time, you know, it's, well, it's another country, first two games of the year, played the same team. Is it a bad matchup? You know, it's really so early in the season that we don't know a lot of things. So I guess if, if you want to hope that we get a different team here um, back in North America, that that's the case. You just had a bad matchup in New Jersey. They shut the middle down on you. And, you know, this team isn't what we saw um, in Czechia. But we're not going to completely ignore all of that and just, you know, hope that things are different. I, there's some things in there that I think we need to, I would not say that are, are extremely concerning uh, moving forward, but it's at this point, of course. Um, but definitely things I think to keep an eye on. And the thing that really stood out to me more, um, the most, I guess you could say, is the offense. So last year, we know this team had a, a hard time generating quality offense. Uh, and, and we saw that again carry over into the two games in Prague, but it's a different scenario. So last season, this was a team that would stick to that transition game even when it wasn't working, and it kind of just was frustrating, and you'd bang your head against the wall, um, you know, hoping they would change something different, and it really never happened because they just didn't have another pitch. Well, in Prague, it wasn't so much a transition game not working. What it was is more of just settling for perimeter shooting. Uh, we saw the shot attempts from defensemen jump. Uh, the article I wrote earlier in the week, you know, 13.64 individual shot attempts for defensemen per 60, which would have been the highest, second highest rate last season. Um, if you take out Byram and Power, who had a pretty good, I would say, especially Power, I think Power was very good in both games. Byram had, I would say, it was decent. Um, their shot quality per shot, their shot quality per attempt was pretty high. You hold them out, the remaining defensemen who had 32 shot, shot attempts, I believe. Over the two days, um, their shot attempt equals basically when you add them all, put them all together with their shot quality, individual expected goal rate was about a 1% rate per shot, if you will. So very minimal outside, low percentage. You're hoping for tips, deflections, bounces, rebounds. Um, not really what you would think this roster is built for. I know a lot of the message... Uh, has been getting to the net more, being more difficult to play against, all of that. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound like that I'm saying that they, they shouldn't do that because I think they should. Uh, I think they need to improve upon that. I think that's something they need to do more. We talked about it last year. Again, it's that having that secondary pitch, something you can do different um, to mix up your offense and give teams a different look. They should improve upon that, and they should do that more. I'm not saying at all that should be something they should do. But that can't be the sole focus of your offense. And it kind of seemed like that's what it was. They need to find that balance, if you will. They need to find that ability to, at times, play that dirty game, get those dirty goals, those deflections, those rebounds, but not lose your fastball of being a transition team. This is what this roster was built upon. Playing fast, getting out on the rush, and attacking opponents um, on the rush. I mean, you have players in your team, Jack Quinn, Dylan Cousins. If, if you're going to try to force them into just playing a net front game, you are going to be disappointed with results. But Turk is another one that, that I think would fall into that too. So I don't think there's reason really to panic yet or to be concerned about it or to worry. Um, you know, in, in these next few games here, uh, Los Angeles, Florida, uh, I think Columbus, Pittsburgh, or all their, some of the upcoming games, I think maybe even Chicago. Those are teams that you should be able to get, for the most part. I mean, Florida and, and L.A. can be difficult. We'll get to L.A. in a little bit here. Um, can be difficult defensively, but those are teams that you should be able to get opportunities on. You should be able to get quality looks. You should be able to get out in transition. Um, if we're two weeks into the season and we're just seeing still a lot of that, what I call hope and pray hockey, um, just hope shots on the outside, deflection, rebounds, then I think we should start to have some concerns that maybe they – 
pull the dial too far the other way. It's all about finding that balance, and that's really what you want. So it's early, it's new. You know, we're not going to freak out or panic about that quite yet. Um, really, I, I, you know, I, I talked about, I mentioned Cousins and Quinn. Um, you know, they're two guys that I didn't mind Cousins in the first game, but especially the second game, they were they were not that line was not good. It, it's got to be better. Um, there's no way this team can realistically be a playoff team if they're not going to get better out of Quinn and Cousins. It's just simply it has to be better. Uh, there was not a lot of looks there. Quinn, I think, for the most part, was invisible. Um, you know, there's a lot of expectations, you know, especially for Jack Quinn this year, that he's going to be an important piece of this team. And, you know, the data and the numbers when he does play really – is good for the Sabres and you're hoping to see that and have that come through, but it really hasn't. And, and that can be you know, part of the concern I talked about. If they're going to play a different style here, well, maybe that mitigates those two players and some of the other players in their roster taking away what they're best at. Now, again, I don't think that's going to happen. I, Lindy Ruff's offense is traditionally in New Jersey, previously in Buffalo, in Dallas. Um, those offensive systems are you know, generated quality offense on a consistent basis. So I would anticipate the same thing is going to happen here. I'd be kind of surprised if it doesn't, because that would mean he made, well, one of two things. He made a, a change in the way that his offensive system works, or just the players just don't work for what he wants to do. And then that's a whole nother conversation we'll have to have. But hopefully that works out. But yeah, to keep it on Cousins and Quinn, like you got to get more there. Um, just, I, again, I, I don't want to get too negative off of two games. I, I really don't. But, you know, Cousins, this has been a little bit here. Um, so there's still obviously time to correct. There's still obviously time to figure that out. But I, I really wonder how long we go here, if it continues to not be great more, most nights. I, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a trade in the season, but it, maybe to alleviate it, is, is it a move to the wing? Is that something that you have to consider at some point? We've, you know, I, I wrote in the article that in Team Canada, and for the Sabres when he's done, when he has done it, he's looked fine in that role. Um, he's even performed well in those opportunities, specifically for Team Canada. You know, it, it would leave a hole in the middle for sure. Um, Ryan McLeod would have to step up, essentially, to your second line center, and then you have Krebs Pilon as your third, or Lafferty, your three, four, whatever. Um, but, I mean, if, if that's what it comes down to to make this work, then I think that has to be on the table. Now, again, we're way ahead of things here. I don't think we're at that point yet. But it's certainly something that if this continues, uh, that could should be a conversation the team has. And then we'll, you know, these podcasts and articles and everything else on our site, uh, we'll probably start to have those conversations and wonder if that is a better fit for him moving forward. On the good side of things, one guy I really wanted to call out who I thought was consistently strong in both games and probably the best player in the years for the Sabres was Owen Power. Um, you know, we're expecting a big jump from him this season. Um, and I think those first two games were excellent. They were a good start. Uh, he looked pretty solid defensively. He was up in the play offensively. He was down in the zone. Uh, he, I mean, he had a goal on the board. So really, it's it's great to see that he has stepped in and might be taking his game to another level. And I think that's encouraging moving forward because this team is really going to have to lean on Darlene and Power to take them where they want to go, um, defensively at least. You know, it's it's Yoki Haru had his struggles. Um, Samuelson had his tough, I think, the first game, second game. I think he settled down with Clifton, but there's still those moments. Um, and then, you know, Byram's always going to have his up and down too. So you really need Darlene and Power to come through for you. And and I think I mean Dowling wasn't bad or anything um, either, but I, I think Power really showed was probably like I said the best player in those two games for the Sabers, and you would hope that continues. And I anticipate that it will. You know, he's I'm, I'm excited. I mean, you have two defensive stalwarts back there now. It's just hoping the pieces around them can provide enough stability or enough break evenness, if that's even a word. Um, when those two are not on the ice or just as support pieces. So the defense has its concerns for sure. Um, 
with exits and other things too. So again, hopefully that cleans up as well. I think that was it was better in the second game than in the first game. Um, you know, but again, you know, we'll we'll see how that all unfolds here as we get more data, more views, more information um as we move forward here. So I just want to call it some positive thing because I'm gonna jump back into a negative here before we move off of those two games. Um and that's the power play. Disappointing. Very disappointing. The second unit I think was I feel was definitely more effective in the first unit, but really it's you know it, it wasn't but it gets the good news is it wasn't really just trying to load up Tage and, and you know Apper said that wasn't going to be a thing anymore. So that's that's good that that did come through. But the entries were just bad poor not i mean it, it's a lot of the errors that were last year i know a lot of people i've said i got a lot of things a lot of messages or replies responses whatever on social media they should abandon the drop pass and you know and that's been a thing a few times people are brought up and i'll tell you one thing is the drop pass entry is a staple of seth appard's power play um that was very big in watching the amrix in the ahl but the difference is is it was very successful in the AHL. I think I tweeted at 90, in the 10 games I tracked the power play, 92% controlled entry rate on the power play, which is very good. Well, why did it work in, why did it work in the AHL and not two games in the NHL so far? Well, I think the difference is there's still too much standing still in the NHL. The whole point of the drop pass is you're coming forward, you drop it back to a player who has all the speed, and your team is coming basically forward with them, uh, your five-man unit against four defensemen that are likely standing still at the blue line or just inside the blue line. So you have the speed advantage that you can make a quick pass there or just carry it in and then set up your offense. There was a lot of coming up the center lane, getting it out wide, and then going into the zone and setting up pretty easily in the AHL. That just didn't work in the first two games one because some of the passing i think was poor um i think players were too flat-footed on the wing it wasn't in unison it wasn't in coordination so by the time that guy's coming up the ice he's either too far back or the drop pass wasn't in sync and then your other players are standing still so when you make that outside pass when it's supposed to be a guy who's coming with speed up the wall that he can easily enter the zone with that speed instead he's standing still so then he's standing still gets the puck tries to then get going but there's a defenseman right there knocks the puck off your stick there it goes down the ice again so I, I I'm not so I don't think that it is a, the process, if you will, or the or the system or the approach that is wrong. I still think it's just not being in sync, and whether that you know it's early in the season, learning a new system, all of that. Um, I I think when it looks good, or when it works, when they do it properly, it'll look good for them, and they'll be able to set up their offense. But just so far, it's been not good it's a lot of what we saw last season and you can't even really off of that you know do a dump and chase because again you have players standing still so even if you come up the ice dump it in your forwards are standing still at the blue line they don't have the speed so the puck's gonna go in the opposing team's gonna get it, it's gonna go right back down the ice again so they have to get more movement in their entries coming to the neutral zone and entering the offensive zone or they're just gonna continue to struggle with setting up the power play and that's gonna be a mess I do like them moving power to the first unit. I think that's going to help with their entries because uh, they're going to have Darlene and Power, who are two of the more high-end, you know, entry defensemen in the league. So I think that'll help in that regard. And again, just get it set up, and then that's what it looks like. So when it does get set up, they do create. They did create some chances. They got pucks in the middle of the ice. They got pucks in the net. There was good movement, um, but it's just about getting it all set up. So hopefully that starts to, you know, kind of work its way out here. Okay, let's transition to the home opener. So the Sabres have the Los Angeles Kings coming into town from the West Coast. It'll be their first game of the season, too. Um, who am I in for someone who lives in the glass house of the Buffalo Sabres to throw stones at a roster? Uh, but looking at the Kings roster, I'm not overly impressed. Uh, especially when you take out Dowdy, their defense, I think, is suspect. Not good, really, at all. Um, so I think that's something you could take advantage of. Now, the thing is, like, you know, the Kings just have a system that just works, and they, they're they good at restricting opportunities and, you know, all of that stuff. But 
I think this is a roster the Sabres can take advantage of. Um, they're a little bit older. I think there's some slower players, especially on the back end, that they can take advantage of. Um, you know, Warren Fogel and Tanner Janot are their two new forward additions in the bottom six. I think those are some nice, decent moves for them. Um, Darcy Kemper is our new starting goaltender. The Sabres have had good history against Kemper in the past. Um, so that's good. Uh, Brand Clark and Quinton Byfield are two guys you want to watch, two of their younger players, two of their more explosive players. Um, so you want to keep an eye on those two. But overall, I, they're, I'm hoping we don't see... I mean, obviously, I'm hoping we don't see what we saw overseas. But I, I just feel like they have to, they have to get on skate. You know, they they really do. I, we can't see another game where they start slow or they or they just look slow. And I think that that's the most frustrating part is for a team that wanted to play faster and did. They got faster players, more aggressive players, um, to make them a quicker team. Just that they still look slow. And I think that it's not that they were skating slow. I think there was some bad anticipation. I think there were some instances they didn't know where to go or what to do. Um, caught in between of that transition or getting pucks to the net. And, you know, and, and that's, I guess you could say, the characteristic of a team that's still trying to get used to a new system. That, for me, that excuse does only go so far because you had the same situation with New Jersey, who came in with a coach, a new coach as well, and they looked to st- you know, to completely understand how that system down pretty well. You can make the argument that the Devils as a team got more preseason games against some NHL talent. The Sabres starters or number one team, if you will, only played two AHL teams and then a DEL team. Um, so, okay. That I mean that that's maybe part of it too, but really I, starting tomorrow, um, no more excuses that there's there's no well one team and overseas and right about 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 now that all goes away now it's you know put up or shut up if you will um a lot of this stuff that they talked about in the season has to start to come through or i mean it'll get bleak fast man it'll get bleak very fast and i i don't know i i i it's frustrating for me because I don't even want to talk about it yet because I just hope we don't get there. We're two games into the season. I, I just don't want to have the negativity build already. You know, if things will go poorly, there'll be enough time for that. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to put those two games aside without like completely abandoning what I saw in that game and also just hoping, hoping for bad matchups and, um, we start to see things turn around as quickly as tomorrow against the Kings. One other note uh, I did want to mention is the Amrix do drop the puck on their season on Friday. So Isaac Rosane, Noah Oslin, Constant Hellenius, Ryan Johnson, Komarov, Novikov, Noichev, a whole bunch of prospects in the AHL this year. Uh, they're going to be a fun team to watch and follow. We'll see when Yuri Kulik gets back down there. Um, you know, I wonder how long he'll sit around with Kubel being out a couple of weeks. Uh, so right now he essentially acts their 13th forward, but you know, I don't know if that'll last a long time. I guess we'll find out and see. Uh, but Kulik, I would admit, anticipate eventually gets down there barring any other injuries occurring here. Uh, so it'll be a fun team to follow. Um, Noah Oslin was excellent in the preseason. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what he does. Komarov in a full AHL, AHL season, who I think was pretty good in the preseason too. Um, Mason Yaps was named the captain of that team today, well deserving. Um, he showed out pretty well too, uh, in those preseason games for the Sabres. So, just want to give the Amherst their love. We'll definitely be doing that tracking again this season. Um, the new player cards will be up after it, it's kind of goofy to do after one game, so probably like after five, we'll start to update and get those out there, um, for people you know to see and start utilizing as we go along here this season. So, uh, almost 25 minutes. Went a little bit longer than I thought it would, but let's hope we get some turnaround here. Let's hope we get some more exciting hockey um, and, and we kind of start to build momentum this weekend. Kings and Panthers both at home, and then I believe it's a three-game, two- or three-game road trip. Um, you know, hopefully we start to start to stack some wins here. You don't want to get to 0 and 3 or 1 and 5 or 1 and 4 or something like that. 
that's definitely not the start you're looking for or the situation to put yourself in so early in the season that you begin chasing right away. So we'll see. Uh, we'll talk again soon. Um, enjoy the games. And we, like I said, we'll talk again soon. See ya.